Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am uh, from Booking.com. My name is Kava Levin. I joined Booking around uh, five years ago in our Amsterdam headquarters. And about two years ago, uh, Booking decided to open a machine learning uh, center here in Tel Aviv. Uh, so that's a jump on this opportunity to come over and uh, help establish a new center. And of course, try to enjoy some of the nice weather and food. Uh, so, uh, for those of you who don't know uh, what Booking.com is, we are one of the largest e-commerce companies in the world. Uh, we're uh, the leading uh, digital online travel platform, uh, focusing mainly on selling recommendations. So, we, uh, we offer recommendations in over 150,000 different destinations, and uh, we received well over, well over a million and a half bookings every single day. So as you can imagine, our scale is quite enormous, and machine learning at this point is really a must for us, and, and not just a nice to have. So this talk will focus on uh, two major uh, technical applications where they were only possible because of uh, deep learning uh, as the core of the solution. Uh, but first, uh, before diving into them, uh, maybe it's good to overview machine learning and booking in general. So, as I mentioned, our scale is quite huge, and uh, today, uh, when you visit our websites, uh, our customer-facing apps, uh, etc., uh, most of the components that you see on our website are either influenced uh, in some way or completely controlled by different machine learning models and pipelines. Uh, of course, machine learning is a huge part of uh, how we personalize our front-end experience, uh, but also, before that, our customer acquisition strategy is very much uh, biased towards performance marketing. So that is uh, very machine learning heavy as well, figuring out how to bid on uh, different channels. And of course, after uh, a booking is made, uh, we need to help our customers with customer service. So things like our booking assistant uh, AI chatbot, or forecasting uh, the demand for our customer service, all of that involves uh, machine learning. And today, more and more departments rely on machine learning as an integral part of their functioning. So, what about deep learning? So, I probably don't have to introduce uh, too much what deep learning is to this crowd, uh, but essentially, a deep learning model is the one that stacks uh, much simpler models on top of each other, which make them into a very powerful pattern recognizers. Uh, and also, they're all about learning representations. So, a lot of the more traditional feature engineering uh, problems uh, can be uh, can be made much easier. Of course, there are a number of significant limitations to uh, deploying uh, deep learning everywhere. Uh, there, there's all kinds of issues related to their interpretability, and um, uh, of course, more challenging to ship, etc. So uh, today, if you take a survey of all of our machine learning models used at Booking. Uh, most of them are definitely still not deep learning models. However, there are a few uh, prominent applications uh, where successful application of deep learning enabled a number of new products and uh, solutions. So these are the ones I really want to focus on, uh, deep diving into exactly how we introduce the solution and uh, scale it up. So the first one is about image understanding. So, why do, why do we really care about image understanding? Uh, if you look at the, our website, or any website for that matter, 20 years ago, they all looked very similar, uh, namely they were very text-based. And over the past 20 years or so, the web experience has become uh, largely more visual. So today, if we want to be serious about uh, personalizing customer experience or optimizing uh, UI, it's, we, we cannot simply ignore uh, visual content. And visual content we have a lot of. Uh, over the years we have collected hundreds of millions of uh, different images, uh, most of them of course related to accommodations, so these are more professionally taken photos uh, by our partners, uh, but also a lot of user-generated uh, photos uploaded by our guests. Uh, we have a very large number of destination-related images, so things like landmarks, city views, etc. Uh, and of course, many of our newer verticals uh, come with uh, their own visual resources as well. 
So it might be very appealing to try to uh, test a lot of uh, image-related hypotheses to try to use that, those images in order to optimize customer experience. So for example, we might wonder whether or not uh, showing breakfast at a certain stage of the customer journey is a good idea, or what's the best way to present the breakfast options are. Uh, we might also wonder whether the main image of a hotel should be seasonal or not. Uh, we have tons of images of rural facilities, so how should we best prioritize them in our uh, photo galleries? And of course, different traveler segments, uh, couples, families, etc., would be interested in very different aspects of uh, the hotel. So we would naturally want to use images to emphasize different uh, features of the hotel uh, that way. In order to do that, we need to tag a very large amount of images. And back when we first uh, embarked on that journey, it was, uh, it was around 2015-2016, it was already becoming obvious that deep learning was the way to go. So uh, there is this uh, very famous uh, large-scale visual recognition uh, competition where the best research and industry teams annually compete on different uh, classification and other image-related tasks. And, uh, 2010-2011, uh, the winners were not deep learning solutions uh, and the uh, year-over-year improvement was something like 8%. Uh, but in 2012, when uh, hardware kept up with a lot of the machine learning research, uh, the world saw a huge improvement of something like 36% in accuracy in uh, the best models. And of course, after 2012, uh, all of the best models were deep learning based and in fact, all of the top competitors are consistently deep learning. Uh, and in fact, in 2015, uh, we saw the kind of superhuman performance of the best deep learning models, at least in that particular uh, open source data set. So our problem is to try to understand our in-house images, the ones that we already have, the ones that come in. And uh, naturally, we looked into uh, available third-party solutions. And uh, although they were impressive, they were definitely not good enough to use for many of our customer-facing products. Uh, mostly the issue was that the tags were too general, and we care about uh, more things that are travel-specific and uh, related to uh, accommodations, what's inside the room, whether or not it's a room for, what kind of view you have, what's the size of the room, etc. Uh, so we needed to build our own uh, solution, which of course came with a number of challenges. So even though we have this hundred millions, a uh, huge amount of data, uh, so first of all we have to scale that process of tagging, we have uh, for any specific binary pro uh, classification problem, we have very unbalanced data set, so we have to deal with that technical problem. Uh, whatever solution we uh, come up with would have to be scalable to new use cases because uh, we receive new products, uh, new, uh, new examples of moderation, etc. Uh, every week. Uh, and of course, uh, one of the major issues was the tag definitions themselves. They're not as obvious as we thought they would be. Uh, so going back to the example of you know, seasonal photo for the hotel, uh, we might want to identify winter in the photo. So some of the photos are very obvious, like this one it has lots of snow, right? Uh, this one also has tons of snow, so it's probably winter. But this is also actually winter, just uh, even though it's a beach photo. Uh, this photo has tons of snow, but it's obviously not winter. And uh, there are photos like this that have no snow at all, but because of the objects and additional context, uh, we know that it is winter. Uh, similarly, it's something like a swimming pool. So swimming pool is a very important facility, hotel facility for us to be able to identify. And some of the photos are very obvious uh, uh, hotel swimming pool facility. Some already become less obvious whether or not it should be tagged as a hotel facility swimming pool. Some are still swimming pools, but they're uh, Olympic swimming pools and have nothing to do with hotels. And of course there are much less clear examples like these two, uh, where, I mean, one day it will be a great swimming pool, I'm sure, but should we tag it as one now? So uh, we had to use a lot of our in-house domain expertise on all these tasks. Uh, and then the solution we went for was a fairly standard at the time uh, transfer learning approach with a uh, last layer fine tuning. So what does that mean? It means that we take the best available at the time uh, classification network. It was in this case uh, 
in Section D3, and we uh, that was tra trained on a massive amount of open source data and learned to classify a thousand different classes. Now, most of those classes uh, we really don't care about, and they have nothing to do with our business. For example, the model would be very good at discriminating cat versus a dog, uh, while we would be more uh, interested in, say, uh, identifying a pet animal versus a non-pet animal. So, uh, nevertheless, we can still uh, leverage a lot of this uh, learning that the model did on this open source data. Namely, we would take uh, all of its um, lower level layers, the one that learned uh, more lower level but increasingly abstract features about the images. Uh, we can take that representation and use it as an input to our own uh, shallow model that would be trained on our own in-domain, in-house classes. And of course those classes would come uh, from uh, the cooperation with our product teams and commercial operations that do the actual tagging uh, and our data scientists. Um, so after we uh, did this for a number of uh, important to our business tags, uh, we actually saw uh, we ran a number of experiments that were very successful. So we saw a number of uh, significant website improvements uh, using these auto tagging models. And if you want to learn more about it, we have a Booking AI blog which has uh, uh, this particular use case described in a lot of detail. Uh, but shortly after we finished this work, we realized that we need to automate a lot of this process in order to scale up faster. So to do that, uh, we built our in-house uh, internal framework that we call iSight. Uh, the idea behind this framework would be uh, even a new use case of what, what we need to tag. Those images would be stored uh, in some uh, optimized image service places. We would also have uh, all kinds of metadata and additional information about those photos uh, stored all over our infrastructure. So a data scientist can uh, use a convenient Python API to just hook up to that data and easily uh, retrieve it. But also a lot of the more heavy lifting and boring things like pre-processing, uh, building data sets, uh, class balancing, etc. Uh, could also be uh, made easier with this uh, API. After, after the model, uh, after the data set is uh, collected, uh, the next natural step would be to build the model. So again, uh, the data scientists can use the iSight API to uh, orchestrate model training by spinning up uh, the right clusters, by uh, asking for the right hardware, hardware acceleration, etc. And uh, once the data science uh, test is ready with the results, once the validation checks are passed, uh, they can of course deploy it to our in-house uh, machine learning platform, which will make the model instantly available to all of our product or operations team to use. Uh, because of all this work, uh, now all of these images come uh, with very business-specific and relevant tags, so that uh, product teams can use that in their personalization or optimization efforts. And today, many of the features that you see on our website uh, would not be actually possible without this uh, large-scale auto-tagging uh, effort in the background. For example, uh, here we see uh, a website feature where we emphasize the uh, some aspect of the hotel, both visually and uh, textually at the same time. Another really nice uh, feature that was possible is uh, better accessibility for our visual impaired users because their screen readers uh, rely on textual descriptions of, uh, uh, of images which uh, is only possible if you can understand what's in the images. And of course our, of course our partners uh, also benefit from uh, automatic image tagging. For example, uh, in one of their products, uh, they can use auto-tagging suggestions to better categorize their uploaded photos. Uh, so that's it for images. Another uh, use case where deep learning played a, a critical role uh, in success was uh, automated our translations. So uh, localization is a huge part of booking.com success scaling up. We translate and localize all of our websites, apps, products, uh, descriptions in 43 different languages. Of course, it goes for all of our customer-facing uh, products. Uh, we let our users leave reviews in their preferred language, and we make those reviews available uh, to other users to read. Uh, our partners uh, 
our partners back from localization as well. And of course, customer partner support uh, is also offered in uh, 43 different languages. Traditionally, all this work uh, has been done by our global network of uh, regional uh, teams, so local language specialists. So these would be people on the ground that really understand the cultural nuances and the language, and they would do all of the translation and uh, personal, uh, localization work. However, in order to keep up with our growth, uh, we have been increasingly considering a lot of the uh, technical solution to automate and to uh, the process to help with the scale. So machine tr uh, translation technology was uh, an obvious attractive uh, choice to consider. Uh, maybe it's nice to very briefly overview uh, history of machine translation as a technology. It actually dates back all the way to the all the way back to the Cold War when uh, uh, countries uh, really wanted to automate the process of eavesdropping on each other. Uh, and back then uh, it was what is now called first generation machine translation, uh, which was very much rule-based machine translation. So what that means is uh, we would put together in the room uh, computer programmers and linguists and uh, write down and hard code the translation rules from one language to another. Of course, as many of you can predict, uh, such uh, approach doesn't work very well and doesn't scale at all because for each rule that you write, you need to write dozens of exceptions and any work that you do on one language pair does not transfer at all to any other language pair. So very quickly that research line was abandoned and uh, as the field of statistical data analysis uh, was developing, the new generation, the second generation of uh, so-called statistical machine translation emerged. Uh, in this approach, uh, instead of uh, writing down and hard coding the rules, we use data or parallel corpus of translated sentences to try to infer those rules automatically. So we would go through a bunch of translations of uh, some text and we try to correlate certain words or phrases to their translated counterparts in the other language. And finally, uh, what is now the most popular uh, third generation neural machine translation uh, approach is the one that based on learning representations. So in, uh, instead of uh, what we do in statistical translation, translating uh, the sentence chunks by chunks, and then somewhat awkwardly often put them together, we would try to understand the whole uh, sentence uh, and uh, translate that uh, in one go. So a typical machine translation architecture would have two major components, an encoder, which tries to read and understand the source sentence and give it some kind of numerical representation and the decoder which additional that numerical representation will uh, output a translated version of the sentence. Uh, for example, uh, recurrent neural networks are commonly used uh, for both encoder and decoder uh, with the difference that encoder, uh, RNN encoder would be working in reading mode uh, trying to read the sentence one token at a time, iteratively updating its internal representation of uh, what the sentence is. And decoder would be uh, working in the generation mode, so it would take that representation and conditional on that uh, output uh, translated version, again, one token at a time. Uh, it turns out this RNN uh, encoder decoder approach doesn't work very well. Uh, without additional ingredient, uh, which is uh, the so-called attention mechanism. So attention, uh, the idea behind attention is while uh, generating a target token, uh, we would look back to the source tokens and try to attend to the ones that matter most uh, for this particular token generation. Uh, in this example, when we, trans oops. Uh, when we translate the word uh, free in German, we would probably look back to the word for in English and uh, use that as, uh, as additional input information at the generation step. So, uh, our first use case for translation was property level descriptions or hotel descriptions. So, we have tons of data that we collected over the years. We had uh, people literally translated millions of those. Uh, and uh, we, so, uh, it, it was kind of a natural choice. It's also a highly manual process, so there's a lot of business value to be had in automating uh, some of it. And of course it's a fairly straightforward uh, problem for machine translation because uh, it's uh, quite a narrow domain. 
Uh, and uh, the style of hotel description doesn't vary that much. So the approach we took uh, was a fairly standard at the time uh, in Core Decoder LSTM with attention, of course. Uh, and we use an open source framework called OpenNMT, which is based on uh, Torch, Lua version of Torch. Um, and we had a few very early and very important learnings uh, while uh, doing this uh, hotel description translation. Uh, first of all, uh, it, while it's easy to tokenize at word level, it leaves you with a closed vocabulary, so you have to only go for the top, uh, say, 50,000 words, and then you have to do something with the outer vocabulary words. So in our domain, most of the outer vocabulary words are some kind of geographical entities, so we use uh, attention based here to copy those from the source. Uh, that didn't work, work quite well, so we very quickly pivoted to the so called uh, byte pair encoding based subword unit tokenization. Uh, the intuition behind it is that it's a statistically meaningful compromise between character and word level tokenization, so that it allows for a truly open vocabulary translation, but at the same time, all of the important and popular tokens are taken care of. Another major learning for us was that we could not just ship an end-to-end -end deep learning uh, model as this, because uh, while automatic evaluation metrics were good, we had a lot of uh, named entity-related uh, business-sensitive errors. Uh, for example, something like uh, times, distances, so translating 55 minutes into 5 minutes, uh, is a known issue in neural machine translation systems, so we had to take care of it. Uh, another lesson was that we could not do away with our uh, human evaluators because automatic um, evaluation metrics such as blue score or validation set uh, perplexity do not always perfectly correlate with human level judgments on things like uh, translation adequacy or translation fluency. And of course, uh, after we built our system, we benchmarked it against uh, the best available at the market uh, general purpose systems and our own in-house statistical machine translation baseline, and it works significantly better, and we could uh, go ahead uh, and productionize it shortly after. Uh, the second major use case for translation at uh, Booking is uh, translating guest reviews. So guest reviews are very important for people uh, to make their decision uh, during their customer journey. Uh, and of course, when, uh, say, a French customer comes and uh, looks at a hotel that doesn't have any French reviews, they might be interested in seeing uh, translated reviews from, say, English. And of course, the hotel manager would also be interested in seeing the translation of uh, their guest reviews. Uh, so, uh, there are a number of problems with uh, user-generated content. It's spelling, punctuation, uh, you know, people mix languages, they use emojis. Uh, but the most important problem was we don't have any data. So machine translation is still a, largely a supervised learning problem, which means that we need to show the system the example of inputs or translated uh, sentences to be translated and outputs, uh, human uh, examples of the translations in order to build the system. Uh, but we don't have that. All we have is a bunch of French reviews, a bunch of English reviews, and not much in between them. So, uh, the solution we went for uh, is the so-called back-translation-based fine-tuning. You can read uh, a lot more technical detail about it on our, uh, on our blog, uh, but maybe I have some time to very quickly overview how it works. Because personally, I think it's quite neat, especially the fact that it works at all. So, uh, again, in order to do machine translation, we need parallel sentences. We need, uh, say, English uh, translated to French, or French translated to English. We have a lot of that for hotel descriptions. But we also have access to a lot of open source uh, data sets, such as uh, movie subtitles, uh, parliamentary proceedings, uh, news articles, etc. So we can take all of that uh, stuff, mix it into one data set, and build some kind of a general purpose English to French model. Now, this model will understand a lot of different domains, but it won't be a very good system. Uh, it definitely won't be good enough to translate our uh, English reviews into French for our French customers yet. But what we can also do is we can uh, build a French to English machine translation model for travel using our hotel description and translate our French reviews into English. Now, those English translations, again, won't be very good. They will look a lot like hotel descriptions, because that's what the system was built on. 
But if you swap the order and make it into an English to French synthetic corpus, the French part that the system would output would actually be quite good. So it turns out that uh, this synthetic corpus is enough to fine-tune our mediocre general purpose system in order to build a, this new fine-tuned system that actually would be good enough to translate uh, our English reviews to French. I know it's a bit confusing. Uh, go on our blog or talk to me after the talk because I personally think it's quite amazing that it actually works. Um, so yeah, to summarize, uh, uh, we overviewed two examples. Uh, two applications where deep learning really made those things possible. Uh, at the same time, deep learning is definitely not the right tool for every single problem. Uh, it has a number of issues. Uh, for example, we can just use end-to-end uh, -end deep learning uh, model in our chatbots because uh, once the chatbot starts saying things we don't like, it will be very hard to debug it because of its interpretability issues. Uh, similarly, many of our uh, front-end, real-time recommender systems that are based on deep learning today were only possible after we invested a bit in uh, non-trivial caching solutions. Uh, so, uh, everything that I mentioned today is available uh, through various posts and articles uh, which are all accessible through our Booking AI blog. Thank you.